to know each other. Tomas did, you know, pretty much all the talking. Uh, Gimon was really quiet. And I was so impressed that this, you know, 20, what, 21, 22 year old was so knowledgeable business, even just business wise in music. And, you know, I, I mean, I was starting to make waves as a music producer, but I'm just some dumb kid from New Jersey. And I'm like hearing him talking about like, Yes, we are making a deal with Virgin, but it's not, uh, we're not really quite sure just yet. And, you know, it's like the confidence, you know, it wasn't like an arrogance, but just a confidence about like, oh, we're going to, we're going to make a, you know, make sure the deal is great. And here I was a kid, like, you know, when I first started putting stuff out, I'm like, I'll sign my life away to Nervous Records because I just want to be on Nervous Records. You know, it's like, so um, I was like, oh, the French definitely have a lot more confidence than Americans do. Like, just all that passion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just, like, you know, I, I guess it's just, like I said, just feeling that, you know, we're going to make sure we do the right the right deal for us, and it wasn't, like, needing to get our foot in the door or anything like that. Like, they knew what they were doing. So what kind of vision did they have for Face to Face if they had one? Um. Well, with Discovery... Discovery was going to be a live action film broken up into uh, music videos. So each song was going to play a part in the film. And it was primarily going to focus on like androids that were kind of being oppressed, you know, uh, I guess almost like a capitalistic society. Yeah, like, you know, uh, the there was going to be like a factory scene where they're working in the factory. And that's like where harder, better, faster, stronger was going to be. and you know, um, the there was going to be this antagonist that at some point that they were going to battle against. And the way Tomas described it is like after the battle and the smoke cleared, you were going to see this giant mirror. And it was going to be like all the people just kind of facing that mirror. In, in other words, they were their own worst enemy. They were the enemy. So uh, the, the idea of face to face, when I wrote the song... Uh, came about based on that premise and you know the 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 words face to face actually it's really saying christopher roberts because it's a sample off of uh an old track but uh you know you know basically i wrote it so you could uh the song could be sung to your like looking in a mirror or singing to another person or singing it uh to god like i needed it to fit all those three those three uh ideas so from the chat, JXHNF09, she asked, um, how did your music production process change after working with Daft Punk for Discovery? Well, the, the production, my production style was there. One of the things that Tomas introduced me to was the Digitech Talker, which is, uh, you know, a vocal, like a, an analog vocoder you hook up your your keyboard to it and then you hook up a microphone and you can synthesize your vocals so i bought one of those which i wish i have now which i don't and they're really expensive but the uh i i started to incorporate more vocoding into my work based on using that i mean you could do so much stuff digitally now uh use plugins for vocoding but it, it was a cool little piece right there and even that still got used in fragments of time uh, the you know the original Digitech Talker, uh, you know Tomas used that when you hear the solo in fragments of time and you hear the vocoding. That's him. In fact, there's video recording of him doing that too, which is really cool. Oh, that's amazing. That was actually a question that we had written down for later. If you knew who was doing that amazing solo uh, in fragments yeah. of time. Yeah, and it's it's great. Like, I hopefully I, I'm hoping like they release that video, but you see him actually singing the part, and like, wow, it's like superbly you know, sang it exactly the way you hear it in the, in the actual song. The, uh, the, the other thing is too, just to mention, one of the other things that inspired me about Discovery, that it was this story that they were telling through songs. And I have an album that basically it was like my first vocal album called Odyssey, which kind of emulated that idea of like telling a story of one person through the, you know, through the album. And I took the album down when I uh, re I bought my back catalog, catalog and then i remastered my album so at some point over the next five years hopefully uh i will release it so you can get an idea of 
you know, my version of my inspiration from their storytelling, basically. Wow, we're, we're really looking forward to seeing that. That sounds amazing. Um, you mentioned um, telling a story with Discovery. Um, it's actually a pretty good segue into a question that's um, I'm inclined to ask because there's a very special anniversary this week, and it's not the one everyone's thinking of. Um, definitely was Interstellar 5555 or Interstellar 45, however you prefer to say it. Um, turns 20 years old this upcoming Thursday, which wow. is a pretty big anniversary. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, the face-to-face -face segment represents like a really refreshingly hopeful point in the film where, you know, we see humanity come together to send our favorite blue pop stars, you know, back to their home planet. Um, how did you feel about this film and how face-to-face -face was used? I think that the, they, they held, the, the story, the, the narrative of the story changed a bit from, I think, the original vision of the live action that they were going for. But I think they kept the essence of it. You know what I mean? I think, uh, you know, at the time, I mean, and what's a really cool behind the scenes idea is that working with them both on, on Discovery and on Ram, the, the, it's almost like a, a clay, like when you're a sculptor, it's like, it's the, the sculptor, the sculpt, uh, sculpture starts out one way. And, you know, the vision can change after a while, you know what I mean? So, and, you know, there was a one point that I think that it was, it was getting a little bit too much to execute at like with this live action. And all of a sudden they decided to turn it into an anime. And it was crazy. I forgot the name of the, the, the talented Japanese anime artist, but, but when Tomas uh, basically told me about it, he's like, did you ever see the show Star Blazers? And I'm like, oh my God, like I grew up on this as a kid. Like this, this show was a sci-fi show about this, these uh, battleships that were converted into spaceships and they had to save planet Earth. And I would watch it every morning before going to grammar school. Like, and it, they would count down on every episode because they had like 365 days to save the earth. And I'm like, how did, like, I didn't even, I was like, I was blown away. Like, how did you even think to like get this guy to animate your movie? Like, I don't know. I, I, my, I never had that type of forward thinking. So hearing them talk about things like that, it's just like genius, you know? People always like talk about how great the music is, but. Everything else that goes into their work is, you know, in the behind the scenes of the business and the marketing is, is just blows me away. Yeah, it really is. They really got to, you know, make such a beautiful piece of art, especially with their, their hero. And um, yeah. we love to be able to celebrate it here. We're all really big fans of the movie. But um, yes, catching back was. up to speed. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, we have our other important anniversary, which is 10 years of Random Access Memories. Um, yeah. There's been a lot going on. We've got um, the expanded album. We have the Snapchat AR experience. We've had new social engagement that we've never seen before. A new music video for um, the Julian Casablanca's track. Um, how have you been enjoying the rollout? How about, oh, I mean, to me, it's nostalgic. Uh, my favorite thing was seeing the when they presented the video to me of the, the writing of fragments of time. And that was emotional because that, you know, working with them the second time changed my life. Cause I literally like packed up a U-Haul after that and moved to LA from New Jersey. Um, you know, so I'm just thankful to, you know, to, to still be playing a part uh, with, with their music and in their lives. And, you know, I made two really good friends out of it. And, uh, you know, like I said, they've been there at crucial moments in my life. Like, you know, I don't want to say saved me, but definitely have helped at, at low points and, you know, and have lifted my career up. And yeah, I think ex exposed my music to a, a bigger world that might not have known because I'm into an underground house music and, you know, they've reached pop level. Yeah, and it definitely would not be the same without you at all. Oh, thank you. Of course. Um, Go on. Keep talking. Yeah. About... <laughs> Sorry. Um, how did they reach out to you about um, their plans for the anniversary edition of the album and their plan to include that little segment of the writing of Fragments of Time? Well, it was about last year in summertime. Uh, Tomas was out with his younger son, and they still have uh, office space in LA. So I went out to visit them and I, I usually see Tomas and Guimon usually probably like once a year in summertime, they usually come out in August. COVID kind of 
put a damper on that for a while, but it was really good to catch up last year. And they told me, and I remember, like, like I said, I mean, the, the great thing about the writing of Fragments in Time is the whole session was recorded. I mean, it was a five hour writing session of us, like, writing the song to most of the song together. Um, you know, because there was a couple elements that, like, when Tomas came up with the idea of Fragments of Time was before that writing session, but the the rest of the song was written in that five hours, and they condensed most of that into this eight-minute clip. And, you know, I think the way they did it and having the music underneath, it it really just added to the emotion. You know, it's almost like a soundtrack to the writing itself. And then the idea that uh, they wanted to make Fragments of Time, the writing of Fragments of Time, like the centerpiece, showing the humanity behind the androids. Um, which is uh, really, you know, just kind of like revealing that you know, there's two humans behind the android. So I, I feel very proud to, again, uh, you know, hear something that we did 10 years ago and it's getting rekindled again. So and it's an I mean, to me, like I said, it's an honor to work with them. Oh, now I hear oh, you. Hear now? Okay. Oh, there we okay. go. Okay. We're good now. I left Ooh. and rejoined. We're fine. Okay. Okay. All I right. just want to make sure it's not something I'm doing wrong. So no, 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 no. you're good now. All right. Let me yeah, restart my question. Fun. I am so I am so sorry. Let me restart my question. All right. So listening to the track, uh, the writing of your energy and passion in the studio with Toma is like contagious. And it sounds like you two are having a really, really joyful process making that song. What was it like revisiting that memory and re-listening to that recording of you guys working in the studio to create that song? Well, like I said, it was it was really emotional. I got to uh uh you know, with the Because team, we played it over Zoom. Uh, Cedric Hervet was in the in the in the chat, and you know I was on video, and uh, you know you could they could see my facial expression, and like even just listening back, they could see like I genuinely just was moved by the experience. I mean, you know it what look the the whole thing about the writing was I I call it I joke around that like I have happy Tourette's <laughs> because like you know when I'm when I'm excited about something I'll just like you know blurt it out like this is so amazing or like, wow, this is great. I've never had this. And, you know, uh, my first experience in LA hanging out with them, it was kind of like a movie. Like, you know, I grew up in the eighties and there, you'd always see these like party movies. And like, I, I was just like, these don't exist. Like, where does this exist? And like, it kind of exists in, in LA. So I got exposed to like going to par these parties, you know, working in this huge studio, this beautiful weather, you know, driving from, Tomas home in the Hollywood Hills. It's like it was something out of a uh, a dream. So, you know, Tomas hearing all these things coming out of my mouth said, "We're going to write that song about your experience here," uh, which made the writing the song really easy because you know there was just so many things. And 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 you know, I said after just being there for a week, I had talked about how I already regretted the fact that I had to go home. I was already starting to like get depressed about going back to New Jersey, you know, here it is like February, it's warm, sunny weather. And I have to go back to like this freezing state and, you know, leave this experience behind. So it really kind of lent itself to the writing of the song and everything you hear in that audio uh, of us writing was genuine writing the song itself, you know, the singing of it, even singing the song when I was singing it, it made me choked up because I was feeling everything that that we wrote you know it wasn't it's not like just we made up some story uh it was it was, it was writing from my personal experience so kind of diving more deeply into the actual contents of the writing of fragments of time and um, manual one of our mods here in the server uh ask wants to know how how did the lyrics for fragments of time change from the very first iteration to what was eventually released on ram well, honestly, it like I said, ninety nine percent of it was uh, was written in that that five hour writing session that was condensed down to the eight minutes. So, so it really kind of was more of just building up the ideas first. You know, like I said, like we when we went to we went to a party and we pulled up to the house. I'm like, I feel like I've been here before. And Tomas is like, remember that, that'll be part of the song, you know? So the only thing that changed from that is like, instead of saying familiar places I've never seen, it was changed to familiar faces. I think it just made it a little more personal. Um, but like I said, like we drove, we drove down from Tomas' house in the hills down to the office 
in his car with the with the roof you know the it was a convertible so the top was down sunny out so the idea of like you know driving the road down the paradise you know uh was part of that you know that's what it was you know um the the coolest thing that i remember too is like was really just coming up with what the name of the song was going to be and we were in in uh, tomas guest room and there's a piano there and we were kind of at the piano just he was playing and we were just kind of trying to think of lyrics and all of a sudden and at some point he just like the light bulb went off he turns to me and snaps his finger and goes fragments of time that's the name of the song so it kind of all started there so 10 years after it was released does the line familiar faces i've never seen still give you the same feeling it gave you when it was first written oh yeah i mean you know i mean la is a very magical place um you know, I, there's still this sense of wonder. Like for me, I don't like. I kind of still fanboy out when you see actors and actresses and stuff. And and that was kind of like the wonder of it. Like you know, going you know, meeting people that. You know, let's put, put exa an example. We went to a uh, a friend's one of uh, Daft's friends' birthday party. Uh, it was at at the Roosevelt Hotel, and you know, there's a DJ there, and I'm like, you know, that DJ could pass as Elijah Wood's double. And someone turns to me and goes, that is Elijah Wood. He has a record label, too, and he likes to DJ. I'm like, oh, my God. It's like Lord of the Rings. That's, you know, it's like I don't, I don't meet actors on a regular basis, you know? So it was like the idea of, like, seeing an actor that was on the screen in front of me was just like, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just funny. Yeah. All right. So I have a question here. This is kind of for me personally, but when I was releasing the song um, "Fragments of Time," I real I was listening to it, and there's a lyric that goes, "Keep building these random memories." Is this potentially where the name of the album came from, or was that already figured out? Seeing that Toma and Guy had a pretty big plan for this LP already, probably before you even came to the studio to make the song. Yeah, I I random access memories. The name of the album was already there. I actually came up with that line, which uh, I'm very proud to say. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I was like, uh, and Tomas was happy with that too. So, yeah. I did something witty. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. And we have another question here. This is from one of our users, Isaac Newton. He says, how many takes did it take to record Fragments of Time? Was there ever a point where you were so close to finishing the song but messed up at the end? No. I mean, well, you know, they do... You, you don't do you don't do the whole song in one take you know so you do you do passes so like you know you do the verses you know might sing the verse over and over again you know just so you get enough uh takes to choose from and then you can edit it down and you know it's the, the same thing with face to face uh just a little bit of trivia here when um i presented face to face to tomas and Guimon, they liked my voice so uh, Tomas gave me some direction on how to sing the song because I, you know, I didn't really have a definitive singing style, and uh, and there's a reason I'm going back to the story, and I'll fast back, I'll fast forward back to fragments. But basically, um, when when I sang face to face the first time, I was like singing it kind of nasally, and he and Tomas is like, "Can you sing it more in the style of like the rock group Foreigner, a little more raspy?" So I I sang face to face twice, just twice. And that's the final cut that you hear on on the 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 song. There was no auto tune. They just layered it and side chained it, and that was it. So you know that kind of almost established my main voice. Like like people people recognize that kind of more of a raspier sound. So um, I just kind of stuck with that idea for fragments of time. You know uh, because again, and if you listen to my other work, like I'll do impersonations. I might sing in different styles to fit the song and stuff but i figured since face to face was so known for that sound let me stick with that so you know and and again as we were doing the takes and stuff the only thing that i really had trouble with like was doing some improv like you know some people could sit there and sing trills and just like come up with like amazingly improv lines <laughs> it just wasn't my thing so that's why you don't really hear too many improvs on there i'm glad we got a, a vocoded solo instead from tomas so on the writing of Fragments of Time, Tomas mentioned some lines from another song on the album, Touch. While yeah. you were working on Fragments of Time, how aware were you of the rest of the project and everything else that was going on to, to produce the album? Oh, I you... mean, 
Sorry, go and, on. Sorry. And did you contribute to the album outside of Fragments of Time? No, Fragments of Time was the only one that I worked on. But what you know, Tomas and, uh, had described to me what the album was going to be like. He kept talking about these West Coast vibes and, and the older way of recording and making music and how, you know, it's not done anymore that way. And uh, I just, you know, I still didn't get a full picture of what this, what he meant by all of it. But of course I was, you know, I was like, sure, I'm on board, you know? Um, so I, the the first day I was there, he played like, pretty much all the tracks in their rough form like just you know the the musical you know all the music that's recorded and i just remember like it just felt like the air got sucked out of the room and i'm just thinking to myself this album is going to be a masterpiece you know i mean it's just i was blown away and then <laughs> then he's like okay and this is the song that or this is the music we want you to write to and and it plays it and it was like it was this it made me a little panicky because it was like it was the country sounding song mixed with gospely soul. And I'm like, you know, inside I'm thinking I've never written anything ever over something like this before. And so I was a little concerned, like, oh, help it come. Like, you know, you want to pull it off the pressure, you know. Um, fortunately, it was really easy to write because of Tomas' idea of writing about my my uh, my times in in L.A., you know, so. uh but it was it was just uh, it's it, but the, the the album itself like i said hearing i heard it in different stages uh from you know they would have musicians coming in to play bass lines like nathan east would come in i heard him playing bass lines over a couple of tracks um uh, i forgot there was one artist that came in and did the you know some of the what's it called the steel uh I can't think of the name. What is the thing that the, the country that twangy steel? Does anyone know the name of the, the instrument? I feel so ignorant right now. The. Uh... Hmm. Steel something. Whatever. Sure. You know. All right, good. At least I don't feel that that bad. You you don't know what it is either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So then kind of following up on that, we had a sort of similar question to that uh, about touch. Um. Like you were mentioning touch lyrics during the writing of. And mm -hmm. the question, this one was specifically about, was there any collaborators from RAM you interacted with or wanted to? I mean, I know you're already talking about some people you interacted with, but was there anybody who you didn't get to interact with that you really want to interact with? I mean, I got to to meet Paul Williams. I Well, th th this is the cool thing. First of all, I got to see, like, I got to be there when Pharrell Williams uh, heard the final product for you know uh for lose yourself to dance and get lucky i was there when paul williams got to hear touch uh for the fun and just you know i mean that that's just a memory that you know you just need to be there because he was he was so blown away by what he heard i was i mean everyone is blown to me touch is a masterpiece track i i just i wish i i've said this before in an interview i, I wish that they toured this album just to see what they would have done visually for touch. I just think that it would have the, you know, th what they could have come up with for such a beautiful song. Um, one, a cool little anecdote with Pharrell, um, th the day that they were recording the videos for lose yourself to dance and get lucky. I asked if he could make a little video message for my nephew at the time because my nephew was going through something rough and he was needed to go for a job uh, job interview and stuff and he recorded the most beautiful like one minute message of encouragement that i still keep on my computer desktop and i sent it to my nephew and he's like that you know he got choked up watching it and uh then when i saw when they were ready to promote ram at at coachella we were uh, at the Bing Crosby estate, you know, they, everyone was invited there to hang and stay overnight. And Pharrell showed up and the first thing out of his mouth when he saw me was, how's your nephew doing? What like what a sweet soul he is. Great guy. That, oh, that that's amazing. And it really I think that really just highlighted, uh, I think, Paul Williams comments at the Grammys when they did the acceptance speech. He said Pharrell has just been mm -hmm. so good. The guys that you just confirmed that so well, man. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, um, also, and I get to know Niall. I mean, I, I opened for Niall. It's like, I met Niall Rogers. And, like, this is this is the man that, like, I grew up 
you know, listening to with chic and stuff. And and he knows me. Like it's not just like, oh, who's that again? It's like he knows who I am. I know who he is. Like it's 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 surreal, you know? It's like you're when you're legendary heroes that have inspired your work, um, you know, become your friends in the industry. Ah, that's awesome. I love that. Um, so this question comes from um Afin and he said and they say, uh, what was the general feeling around the studio during the development of RAM? Was there any indication of this is going to be our final album? Um, I don't, I don't think that uh, th there was a, per se an uh, uh, indication it was the final album. I know that, you know, personally, there was kind of a rough start. You know, Tomas had mentioned, because, you know, at the time, he didn't, the, like, at, like, after the album or during the album, they had, he had built a studio for himself in Paris. But up to that point, I think he was in, there was like kind of this transition period that they didn't, he didn't really have a studio, uh, a personal studio, which kind of made it difficult to vibe off of. And uh, I think the initial, the initial uh, work that they were doing was, you know, putting together some samples and it, and it just wasn't clicking for them. And I think that, you know, uh, he had, they had the epiphany of going back in time and taking those samples and then bringing them new life through actually getting musicians to play them and that's kind of how the album you know took flight per se but i i didn't get the sense that it was going to be the last album i think afterwards the reason why i wasn't shocked by the breakup is i know from speaking to tomas they kind of seemed like they were on two separate paths i mean you know Gimon has a love for like hip hop and and doing stuff in that world and Tomas kind of I think had his sights set on other things like you know he loves cinematography and directing and you know it just seemed like you know when you when you work on an album like that it's uh it's intense you know it's like I I said this before <laughs> I think you can compare it to like being on a submarine <laughs> with with uh, a bunch of people and you're out at sea for like months you know, it you can you, know, you get to know people, you can get close to people, you know, you can enhance the relationship, but it also can, you know, you need your space after you you come back to doc, <laughs> you know, and I think that uh, you know, it's it's it just gets difficult sometimes to continue that magic, and uh, you know, but I also think that just because there's a breakup doesn't mean that at some point there's not another epiphany and says, hey, let's get back in the studio together. You know, I wouldn't count that out. Right. And either way, um, what an album to go off um, to leave us with, you know, like yeah. quite a swan song. Um, speaking sure. of between um, this album and Discovery, um, how do you feel the process of production with Guy Mantema like changed between you three, um, between Face to Face in 2001 and Fragments of Time over a decade later? I th I mean I obviously if you if you listen to the albums there is definitely an evolution to to the way they work to like again I think if you if you even go before you listen to homework and it was it was a collection of amazing house tracks then discovery kind of I think sounded more like in you know a, the the storytelling it's like an, uh, an artist uh, driven album you know I mean you have your slower songs mid tempo songs or dance tracks like. I think it 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 sounded even more well rounded, you know, um, and then with Human After All, it it almost like I think like you hear it felt like it was scaled back. It kind of stuck within a certain, you know, they they use certain elements throughout all the tracks. You know, it was uh you know, a, 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 a more narrow vision for what they were doing, and then here they tore the album. And which kind of brings all three albums together and kind of, you know, congeals it. Then you got the, the, Tron, the Tron Legacy soundtrack, which combines their style with contemporary orchestra. And then now you, you put all that together and it's almost like you add all those things up and you get RAM because it has a bit of all of that. You know, there's the there's orchestral elements in, in some of the tracks and the interludes. You know, some of the tracks are harder and has that edge that Human After All has, you know, um, Get Lucky, you know, has that vibe almost like it was a sample that was, you know, it wasn't a sample, but obviously it kind of has that sampley feel that you got from Discovery, you know. Um, 
so you know i to me it's just like if you follow the journey it's a really beautiful artist's journey so kind of going off of that um how do you feel that your time working on fragments of time and working on ram affected your own production style and production methods and how was it different from what you learned from discovery and fragments and face to face I mean, I being a dance music producer, you know, like my thing is like I've always been explorative of of uh, sampling from records and whatnot. But my world was small in comparison to what they accomplished with Ram. And I wouldn't like again, just the way I was blown away by them, you know, reaching out to their favorite Japanese anime uh, creator. The idea that they're like, hey, I'm going to reach out to, you know, the guitar, the guitarists that work with Eric Clapton. I'm going to reach out to the engineer that worked on Prince's Controversy. Like, I would have never thought of that in a million years. So it's like it broadened my horizons. Like, I never I never knew how live music, like how drums were recorded and, you know, seeing this. And it, it sounds ignorant considering I've had decent success in my own career, but you know, being more electronic based, I never saw, you know, I never did that myself. And then the idea is what I've constantly learned is how much goes into the music beyond the music, you know, um, with discovery, again, the storytelling, the, you know, at the time they, that's at the point where they decided to invest and make masks to, you know, not only add this mystical element to the androids, but also to give them anonymity with with ram they decided to because they were doing most of the recording process through analog um you know using mixing boards and 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 classically you know the classic trained engineers they decided to roll out the promotion very analog they they put billboards up all over la um you know i remember them going through books of just studying what what billboards worked uh, in the seventies and whatnot, and then just rolling out rolling out the uh, you know the teasers on like during Saturday Night Live commercials. They would they would you know I mean no one really promoted albums through uh, TV anymore really you know um, and then even just recording lose yourself to, the videos for lose yourself to dance and get lucky. They did that with 65 millimeter film as opposed to using digital. There was nothing digitally done. Like they built this huge cylinder to put the, you know, to put the, the band inside uh, for Get Lucky. And the thing and the, and the cylinder rotated with the, it had holes in it with silver streamers behind it that were lit up. So it sparkled. So you see like the stars moving around them and I mean, they literally, it, co it was so expensive to build this large set for, for uh, a trailer for, you know, for an album that didn't even get a full video. Like, got, Get Lucky never really got a full uh, video made, you know, they, they just did it for these commercials. And then even at the, the last shot in Get Lucky, you'll see, you see them playing in front of a, a sunset. And that was a huge, huge lit up picture. And, and then they had like uh, a camera with with flames being shot, you know, in front of it. So it created the wavy effect that you get from heat from the sun. I mean, you know, it, when they when they commit to an idea, they commit to an idea. So um, most people sit there and fanboy out over the music. I fanboy out of how they built their empire and what goes into, uh, you know, it's the, the music is just one element of a, of a greater picture. Yeah, they had just this amazing vision and they went for it. And it was just such yeah. a big, grand vision. And it was so iconic. And it went really great because we can all remember um, 2013, the original billboards. And now we get to see new ones, um, new billboards popping up for uh, Ram 10, which is just amazing to see. Really nostalgic for people who lived through um, the first rollout and just a great opportunity for those who didn't, for those who were too young. Um, speaking of... <laughs> um, being iconic, um, one of our users, Miros, asks, despite your extensive history as a garage house producer and renowned DJ, your singing voice is one of your most recognizable traits because it's of its unique timbre and soulful quality. 
was there any particular musician or a certain sound or delivery that you wanted to emulate while singing the vocal takes for fragments of time in face to face? Um, I like I said, I took Tomas direction for for uh, face to face. He wanted something a little more raspy because it comes like a, I, I guess you know, just like I don't want to say a diamond in the rough because I'm not patting myself on the back for being some epic singer. But, you know, like I said, it was just this unrefined voice. You know, I never really sang professionally. I always fantasized about becoming like a, a pop star and I would sing while I was in high school. But I never, you know, it's funny because I had a few friends tease me at the end of high school, which was I was so insecure as a kid that I actually put singing on like on the back burner and just focused on my production. And it, do you know, even with face to face doing well, you know, I wasn't, the internet wasn't as big when, I mean, it, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it was getting bigger, but it wasn't as big as it is now. So I wasn't really following how many people really loved face to face. And it wasn't until literally I moved out here to LA at like 40 years old and people coming up to me, it's like, I never knew you were the voice on face to face. I love that song. I love your voice. And like, you know, all this time I could have been singing more <laughs> and doing more. And it's like, uh, it's it's crazy because you know this is why you should always believe in yourself and don't let anyone's criticism ever hold you back from pursuing what you want to do and with fragments of time like i said i think you know over the years i kind of mature my voice matured i kind of felt more confident in my singing and you know i, I kind of have a better grasp of what the way i should sound on a track so they didn't really uh give me too much direction on fragments of time but tomas came, paid me a really great compliment he's like you know he's like you have really good pitch he's like with every take you sang it exactly the same like you know uh he was impressed with that and he encouraged me to focus on my singing more which i am so um recently uh, the first episode of memory tapes with julian casablancas was released Mm -hmm. And in it, there's a lot of, there's some videos that were taken during the recording process of Random Access Memories. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that they recorded some, and specifically you mentioned the Tomas, Tomas singing the vocoder part for, uh, for Fragments of Time. Yes. Is there anything else from stuff that was recorded for Random Access Memories that you would like to see them make public and available? Um, yeah, well, I, there, there was, uh, uh there was like see you know uh like nathan east playing bass on a couple tracks there was the, the funny thing is is uh uh the there's a kanye uh the, there's one track that never made it to the album it's just drums um that kanye used for one of his tracks on his album and like you hear nathan east playing some bass which actually is running through uh, a vocoder itself or some kind of uh, setting that makes it sound like a voice instead of uh, just a bass sound. And it's like anyone that's a Kanye fan would, would recognize those drums. Are you, uh, are you talking about Black Skinhead by chance? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, because I forgot the name. I'm terrible with names, so thank you for, uh, for, for bringing that up. Yeah, it was like crazy. You know, when people when I heard that for the first time, I was like, no one knows that this originally was supposed to be for Ram, you know? Okay, sweet. Um, so this question comes from Jay Loped, and they ask, are there any funny things that happened during Ram's production? Uh, any funny things that happened? Um, I mean, nothing like crazy uh you know i mean the experiences were fun but like i can't say there was anything like really like laughable m moments per se you know um i i've i've told this joke not joke but i've i've i told this anecdote before um when i when i was there for the second time you know when uh be, for the final mastering of ram I was with Tomas and Guimon, and I don't know how it came up in conversation, but you know, during their uh, during their making, they made Tron Legacy, the film score. I had, I had emailed them afterwards, and I had lost touch for a while because I went through a dark period in my life, and I reached out to them to to tell them how great the 
the soundtrack was. And I had just by chance had both their emails and that started to dial. I thought I'd like because I'm going to have to Hey. Um, hello, are you there? You lost you, Todd. Thomas, you there? Uh, Todd, if Todd, you we, hear Todd, us, we lost, cut out. we lost you. Uh, oh, no. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sound like his Wi-Fi went out. Oh, no. One second, we'll troubleshoot um, this. Yeah, give us a second. Wait. Todd, if you can hear us, if you can re- try to leave and rejoin the voice call. Okay. Let me see if I can. I got to find him in this. Maybe in one place at once. But yeah. Um, uh, sorry. I, where did I get cut off? Do you remember? I have no clue. We were trying okay, to fix I'm that. I'm sorry. Maybe we just we go could, on to... We can just move on. Yeah, we can just move yeah, on to the next on. question. So, um, speaking more broadly about your production with the rise of AI and the rise of this of like Snapple snitching and all that. How do you think that will affect yours, your legacy and Daft Punk's legacy as these samples continue to get found and discovered? And this, well, this question comes from Rift. So thank oh, you, yeah. Rift. My bad. <laughs> Well, I, I, I love when I was younger, I did it too. It's like, I love finding samples that my favorite artists have used. Um, you know, I, the, the thing is, is I think for artists in general, it's, I mean, like, let's put it this way. There are people that use samples and, you know, a few samples in their tracks for me personally it's it makes it difficult because i i use hundreds of samples like you know some some tracks could have like 70 samples in it you know and the idea of trying to clear that many samples is it's ridiculous like there's there's no way it, it's it's something that could be done on a positive note you know you have services like splice where people are selling sample banks that they made and i recently discovered a, a, a slew of samples under the phrase resample where basically you have people that are trying to make uh, basically impersonate clips that you hear from old funk records you know i think that the tiktok generation has brought this you know to the forefront so it's like it actually sounds like oh this is someone someone sampled an old soul record and it really isn't it's just Someone just played a bass, a guitar, a piano, and put a vocal on it, so it sounds like a clip from a soul record. And it sounds really good. So I've been able to kind of emulate my old work uh, by sampling from these type of banks off a of splice. However, part of the magic of, of sampling is taking uh, concepts and ideas from old work that no one's ever heard of before and bringing it into something new you know it could be a chord progression that i would never have the talent to think of myself or you know um you know a melody that that could be lost in time uh ironically it's it's crazy that so many people now especially in dance music are sampling things that were already successful and putting them in their tracks which is you would think that that would happen less and less but i think you have a lot of artists that are more willing to have their music be used as samples to make money off of, but. Hmm? Did we lose him? Again? Did he cut out again? I think. Uh, okay, you might need to leave and rejoin, rejoin again. again. Oh no! I don't know what's going on. Sorry. All right, let me pull him back up. Is it because someone's using this set of? Is it? It might. Using... It might be. I'll. I'll get it taken care of in a second. That's okay. Um. Um. Is there anything else on that question you want to add on to, or we can move on to the next one? It's fun. We can move on. I ramble, so I apologize for my long-winded answers. <laughs> all but don't good. Don't apologize all good. at all. We love to hear it. Um. Okay. So this question comes from Krisha, and she says, "I'll admit while, that while I'm a fan of Daft Punk and love the two songs you did together, I'm not really familiar with your work. Which songs of yours would you recommend?" 
Um, well, what I would do is go on, um, well, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for more vocal stuff, I've worked with a group named Poolside. You know, the, if you go on Spotify, like the top things that are played, um, I did, I did something with Groove Armada that I sang on and, and, uh, wrote the song. But if you, I mean, it, I've released a slew of my back catalog on defected records which focuses more on the cut up sample style that you hear in face to face. Um, it's funny because, you know, I'm very well known for my cut and paste style and making a musical collage of samples, you know, pasting them together. And a lot of people love to dig for sa the samples that are in face to face. Funny enough, Tomas did a lot of the playing of those samples. Um, so he literally, if you wanted to imitate a Todd Edwards track, he, he knows how to do it. But those, the samples that are in that track, 90% of those samples came from my sample banks. And, and what is sampled has, like the palette of samples, it has more to do with my signature than just even how they're arranged. And, uh, you know, anything from defect, that's on defected records right now will give you an education of my history of music. So, and again, I'm like thankful because, you know, you see how, you know, artists can be known regionally, globally. Working with Daft Punk has helped to bring in a, a, a bigger audience to a, a, a smaller niche sound of music um, that I get to share with the world. So I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, I love that. I also want to give a quick shout out to the song, The Chant. I absolutely love that one. It's such oh, a great thank one. thank you. Yeah, that's a good. That's a thank you. You, you know, it is when I get put on the spot. I'm like, what? What should I listen to? Uh, I'm not sure. The chant. The chant is a great example of, you know, cutting up samples. Got a vocal on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so, going a bit back to Ram for a second. Aside oh. from working, aside from Daft Punk themselves, what other artist albums or songs did you use to guide you through writing and producing fragments of time? Um, well, you know what? I grew, I grew up in the seventies and the eighties. So I love writing in the classic style. Like, you know, if you notice a lot of modern music, the, like a lot of songs these days, I'm going to sound like an old producer. When I made back in my day, songs were written better, but, uh, the, uh, the music today, a lot of the songs are, are written almost like mute, like commercials. Like the, the, there's a gimmick there. Um, but a, a good portion of it is just to make something catchy, but there's not a lot of storytelling behind it. And I grew up in the seventies where there was like a lot of rhyming schemes, like ABAB type of rhymes. Um, I love Stevie wonder sounds of the, my, my, my older cousin had given me the, uh, the cassette of sounds of the key of life. And I rinsed that, that cassette, you know, I was always inspired by groups like ABBA, you know, which, you know, basically had this musical journey with their songs. Like there, there was so many chord progressions and changes within that. Um, you know, I loved Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, you know, uh, Duran Duran. I'm just trying to think of like, there were so many, there were so many wonderful artists that I grew up with in the eighties that, you know, uh, from, you know, and that's the thing about pop music was very diverse in the eighties. Cause you had a lot of dance, you had some rock thrown in there, some soul, um, you know, pop music, I think definitely has gotten to the point where it's a little more manufactured and less human. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have like, I think three more questions left. We're going to try to get these pretty quick since we're running low on time. So this one comes from one of our admins R, and they say, do you have any studio rituals to help you get in the zone? I sacrifice a goat. To Satan, every no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, rituals. Well, basically, I'll stop at Dunkin' Donuts, get myself a coffee. Usually, um, I I dress in the same. Like I have to wear really comfortable clothes. Like I'm I'm very like sensitive. Like I'll wear like sweatshorts and a t-shirt. Like that's my studio gear always. And then I'll procrastinate for a good hour or so because, you know, I could never just jump right into making music, um, you know. So, yeah, that's pretty much that. I, I start my day late. I am like, I am the, the opposite of being an efficient 
machine. You know, it's it's amazing that I've had a successful career for the lack of efficiency I have as an artist. So I used to work, I used to work opposite hours, like you know, all night and then sleep all day. As I've gotten older, I've gotten a little more healthy with that, and I'll get in the studio, you know, and uh, you know, put my time in from like twelve to six or twelve to eight. Yeah, sweet. All right, and then this next question comes from late night, late nighter fighter, and they say if you had to, if you had to choose between face to face or fragments of time as your favorite collaboration with the robots, which one would it be? Ooh, that's rough. That's really. I, I know. Me, I but... know. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it's like between storm. your two kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, I, I you can't don't make me answer that like that. I mean, <laughs> they both opened up my worlds in different ways. They really did. You know, um, I, I would, I, I mean, if I, if I default to fragments of time, it's only because, um, on a personal level, moving to LA changed my life. It opened up my world and gave me an individuality that I didn't have when I lived in New Jersey. So, you know, that happened there, but fa I mean, face to face and like, you know, I got to meet like, you know, the the Daft Punk family. I mean, Pedro Winters, who's, you know, the you know, the guy that owns and uh Ed Banger Records and manages Justice. So it's like, you know, I got to meet him when he was their manager, DJ Falcon, um, Gilda, who went on to make Kitsune Records in the fashion line. Like I I it just, both times just opened my world, you know. Um I was just some like naive kid from Jersey, you know. So that's the best I can give you. <laughs> well, we, we love to hear all these different insights. So we have time for just one more question before we close it out. Um, so we got this question from user Anatol from today. Um, they said, Todd, you really inspire me. I'm 19 years old and I want to make music for the rest of my life. I've been making music forever, but was never professionally educated. What kind, if at all, mu uh, musical education did you receive? And what would you recommend for young people like me starting out and spending time learning well um i did not study music professionally i actually went to school for marketing i did take a year and a half of piano one of the most important things i would recommend to you and i think it, it's very easy for because there's so much technology out there that you don't learn how like an instrument or something i think learning music theory like for me piano and understanding how chords work it's like learning the alphabet because it's easier to write poetry when you understand how to make words. So, you know, picking up a, a book on chords, you know, getting yourself familiar with piano um, is a good place to start. I, you can learn a lot from listening to music. Um, I was taught from like a cousin, you know, if, when you listen to a song, you know, you listen to the, you try to break it down in your head, like, listen to the the bass line that's going on like the guitar listen to the 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 harmonies like break try to listen to it in all the elements individually in your head cuz that will slowly start to help you to understand how music is made so then you'll be able to listen to it you know uh all the elements separately and then listen to them as a whole in your mind and that will become natural to you the other thing is is you have to not quit on yourself if i had a a, a a dollar for every time I wanted to give up, I would be rich just off of that. And every time I wanted to quit, a new door would open. And I would say that it always felt like it was either God or call it the universe, whatever you'd like, was kept telling me, would you stop doubting yourself and just keep going forward? Though That's really important. And then also, you know, uh, my last statement is music, you know, the, the, any art form, imitation is the starting place because like you know you listen to what inspires you and then you want to make something in that style but as you grow you try to put yourself into it you know something that's uniquely you that's how i was able to you know to develop this longevity that's what got the attention of daft punk when um they wanted to work with me um my style was based on something i wanted to be unique i didn't i didn't know it was going to have the impact it had but I wanted a signature sound. So when you put on a Todd Edwards record, you knew it was me. And I mean, that's basically how it worked for me. So hopefully that advice can help. Wow, that is just, it's really inspiring to hear your advice. And um, obviously it's gotten you this far. So we know it's um, 
very important I did to some, take to heart. Right. We, we hope everyone can, you know, really internalize it. Yeah. Cool. I hope so. And always, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I'm kind of flaky sometimes on socials, but if you, I'm Todd Edwards 3000 across, you know, all platforms. So if you ever have a question, if I can answer it, I'd be happy to try to do that. You know, it's hard to get to them all, but I, I would love to always help out. Yes, and you were just live on uh, TikTok yesterday. So um, if anyone here has that. questions yeah. that we didn't get to get to. Live. My first live on TikTok. <laughs> oh, it was your first one? Oh, it went great. Yeah, I'm addicted to TikTok now. I used to like be like, ah, TikTok, it's, it's great. Now I'm like, I'm on it every day. It sucks you in. It does. It's it, so does. it does. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if everyone wants to keep an eye out for... Um, Todd Edwards' future TikTok lives where you can ask him questions there. Um, so sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. We had so many, but um, they're all great. I'm sorry. And That's because I ramble. That's because I talk too much. That's my problem. <laughs> no, no, we love to hear it. We got through all of our pre-selected questions and um, like two That's or three cool. of the pulled ones. So um, mm -hmm. we had some great well, answers. You, we loved talking to you. If you don't mind me saying so, and I'm not just trying to plug it, but if, if anyone did have questions from today, and you want to reach out on TikTok, I'll be happy to do my best to either, you know, write in, uh, a comment back or maybe I'll do a live on there just to answer more questions, you know, so. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would be appreciative of that. So thank you, Todd, for that. Pleasure. Absolutely. Yes, thank pleasure. you so I thank much. You all. It was really, I love, I love chatting about the Daft days because they were so inspiring to me and I'm thankful to call them friends and, you know, to have the opportunity to work, you know, twice. Not many people can boast that either, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so yes. much for this thank opportunity. Thank you so much. We, we're thank so grateful. So we're all big fans. Um, I'm sure we got a lot of thank yous pouring into the different chats. <laughs> well, you all have a lovely day. Of course, you too. You thank too. you so much again. And everyone yes, enjoy the 10th anniversary Ram. Enjoy the, the, the nostalgia. We are. We got that playing 24-7. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good day, guys. Have a good day, Todd. Thank you. you Bye. Too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening. That was a really great conversation we got to have. Right. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you to our friends over at DB Social and um, Todd's manager for getting us all in touch. And we hope we can uh, do more like this. Yeah. Hopefully this won't be the last time. All right, be sure, to st be sure to hang around the server and stuff. Be sure to stay tuned for, like, new announcements and stuff. I'm sure there's more stuff coming with the rollout of RAM 10 and such. So be sure to stay tuned. All right, thank you all. Bye.